Welcome back, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. I'm David, and this is David Reads Narnia. We are reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So grab your copy and follow along. This is chapter seven. Now, before we get into chapter seven, I want to invite you to become a patron on my new Patreon channel. You can find it at davidreadsnarnia.com if you're not already there. Now, I'm committed to recording every single chapter of every single book, just like what you've seen me do, and uh, they will continue to get better and better. And I'm committed to creating that for free for everyone to see. Now, that being said, if you like it and you would like to contribute to the cause and help support it, you can become a patron. As our patron community grows, we'll be able to open up some really cool new features. So there's a lot of really cool new things. Check it out at davidreadsnarnia.com. If you're not already on there now, you got to go and check it out. So to recap, at this point, where we left off in chapter six, all of the kids have stumbled into Narnia and they're kind of lost. They're following a Robin because they're not really sure what else to do, but they know they're on this epic adventure. And that's where we left off. This is chapter seven, A Day with the Beavers. While the two boys were whispering behind, both of the girls suddenly cried, oh, and stopped. The Robin cried, Lucy. The robin, it's flown away. And so it had, right out of sight. And now what do we do, said Edmund, giving Peter a look, which was as much to say, what did I tell you? Shh, look, said Susan. What, said Peter? There's something moving among the trees over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could. No one really felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it too that time, said Peter. It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan. And then, though nobody said it out loud, everybody suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like, said Lucy. It's kind of an animal, said Susan, and then look, look, quick, there it is. They all saw it this time, a whiskered, furry face, which had looked out at them from behind the tree, but this time it didn't immediately draw back. A moment later, the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all around as if he was afraid somebody was watching, and then he said, hush, and then made signs for them to come and join it in a thicker bit of woods where it was standing, and then once more it disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver. I saw its tail. It wants us to go with it, said Susan, and it's warning us to not make a sound. I know, said Peter. The question is, are we to go to it? What do you think, Lou? Well, I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Should we have to risk it, said Susan? I mean, it's no good just standing here and I feel I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter, let's give it a try. I'll keep close. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it. And there, sure enough, they found the beaver. But it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, further in, come further in, right in here. We're not safe out in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where the four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and the brown earth and the pine needles could be seen under foot because no snow had been able to fall there did it begin to talk to them. Are you sons of Adam and daughters of Eve? it said. Well, we're some of them, said Peter. Shh, said the beaver, not so loud. We're not safe even here. Why, who are you afraid of, said Peter. There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us to her. You know who I mean. 
and it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about signs, said Edmonds, how do we know you're a friend? Not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but see, we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these little words, he held up a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise until suddenly Lucy said, Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fellow, he got wind of the arrest right before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I should meet you here and take you on to... And here the beaver's voice sank into silence and he gave one or two very mysterious nods. Then, signaling to the children to stand close around as they possibly could so that their faces were actually tickled by his whiskers, it added in a low whisper, they say that Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't fully understand, but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning. Either a terrifying one, which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and you're always wishing that you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each of the children felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by. And Lucy got the feeling that you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it's the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. And what about Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy, where's he? Shh, said the beaver, not here. I must bring you to where we can have real talk and, and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now, and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest part of the forest, for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them, and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later they came out to the open sky. The sun was still shining. They found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley, at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across the river. And when they saw it, everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that he now had some sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you're visiting a garden that they've made or reading a story that they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, what a lovely dam. And Mr. Beaver didn't say hush this time, but merely a trifle, merely a trifle. And it really isn't finished. Above the dam was what ought to have been a deep pool, was now, of course, a level floor of dark green ice. And below the dam, much lower down, was more ice. But instead of being smooth, this was all frozen and in wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreath and festoons of the purest sugar. And out of the middle, and partly at the top of the dam was a funny little house shaped, rather like an enormous beehive. And from a hole in the roof, smoke was going up. So that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungry than you were before. That is what the others chiefly noticed. But Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up that valley, Edmund could see two small hills and he was almost sure that they were the two hills that the white witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamppost the other day. 
And then, between them, he thought, it must be her palace, only a mile off or less. And he thought about the Turkish delight, and about being king, and I wonder how Peter will like that, he thought to himself. And horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, said Mr. Beaver, and it looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way. But be careful, don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not for humans a very nice place to walk because it was covered with ice. And though the frozen pool was level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in a single file out to the middle where they could see a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound. And the first thing she saw was a kind looking old she beaver sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth, working busily at her sewing machine. And it was from it that the sound came. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said holding out both her wrinkled old paws. At last, to think that I should ever live to see this day. The potatoes are on and boiling and the kettle's singing and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house. Peter went with him and across the ice of the deep pool to where he had a little hole in the ice in which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with him. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being chilly and looked hard into it, and then suddenly shot in his paw, and before you could say, Jack Robinson had whisked out a beautiful trout. Then he did it all over again, and again, until they had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house, and put on the frying pan to get the drippings hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds, there were bunks, like on board a ship, built into the wall, and there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oilskins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying mortar in and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks and the cloth on the table, though very clean, was very rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned out in the open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying, and how the hungry children longed for them to be done, and how much hungrier they still had become before Mr. Beaver said, now they're ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back into the empty pot to dry while Lucy was helping Mrs. Beaver to dish up the trout so that in a very few minutes, everyone was drawing up their stools. It was all three-legged stools in the Beaver's house, except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair beside the fire. Preparing to enjoy themselves, there was a jug of creamy milk for the children. Mr. Beaver stuck to his beer and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as they wanted to, to go with the potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree, there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish to eat it when it's been alive a half hour ago, and it's come out of the pan a half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, and Mrs. Beaver had unexpectedly brought out of the oven a great and glorious sticky marmalade roll, steamy hot and at the same time moved the kettle on the fire so that when they had finished the marmalade roll the tea was made ready to be poured out and when each person had got his or her cup of tea each person shoved back on his stool as to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment and now said mr beaver pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea towards him if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit and going nicely, why now we can get down to business. It's snowing again, he nodded, cocking his eye at the window. That's all the better because it means we shan't have any visitors. And if anyone is trying to follow you, they won't find any tracks. Tune in next time for chapter eight. Chapter eight is called, What Happened After Dinner?